Okay, welcome back to another episode of Behind the Business. Super excited for this episode. Today we have Della. Um, initially, I was thinking about guests for this podcast and my mom said, you got to go to Flowers and Things, right? So I went over and I met Della and asked her to be on the show. But I quickly found out that her story is much deeper than just flowers and things. <laughs> so with that, Everyone, welcome Della to the podcast. Oh, wow. Thank you so much, Miles. That's awesome. I'm so excited to be here, actually. <laughs> this isn't everybody's story so much deeper than what it seems like? Yes, yeah, that's exactly why I wanted to do this. So <laughs> I love to hear the stories and, you know, it's always like from the outside, especially business owners, you think you think one thing, but the story, each individual story is almost so much deeper. So. Absolutely. Love to dive into that. Yeah, absolutely. I love to tell it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Good. So we're going to have a bunch of fun here today. Yes, absolutely. So I always like to start kind of like the comic book origin story. Mm -hmm. Where are you from? Mm -hmm. What type of kid were you? Mm -hmm. The early stages. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a whole lot of story, right? So um, going back to my childhood, actually, I was um, I was born in Iran. You know, little Middle Eastern country with very good reputation. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I was uh, born there and uh, I lived there till I was about 13. Um, my dad was alcoholic, so that was a whole different dynamic uh, in, in our house. So I grew up with a bunch of issues. Yeah. <laughs> and um, there was a war going on and there was a lot of trouble in Iran. So my mom decided that we, she had enough. So she took me and my brother, who is six years younger than me, and two suitcases. And she decided to move out of Iran into France. So... She, I mean, she spoke a little bit of uh, French, but none of us did. So we moved to France. I was a teenager, uh, very impressionable. And that was a big shock for me, right? Because yeah. you go to France, all of a sudden, there's so much freedom. And the young kids there were crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and it took a lot for me to um, hold my own. Because now I went from a place where I knew everybody and the language and the culture and I had people who loved me. And all of a sudden now I had no one, like no friends, no relatives. The language was new. Brand new reality. Brand new reality. And I got hit really bad. But I think I was really resilient because, uh, you know, I, I was really good. I was strong. I didn't start smoking. <laughs> I didn't start drinking. Uh, so that, doesn't everyone smoke in France? <laughs> th th that's right, right? Like all the kids, I was like, wow, look at all of them. They're, they smoke. Anyways, um, but I spent so much time on my own because I had to figure out things on my own. So I spent... Oh my gosh, it, I would spend hours looking up words in the dictionary. Back then, yeah, that was a long time ago. We, we didn't have Google yeah. Translate, so we had to use dictionary. And I had this dictionary, it was called Le Petit Robert, but it was like this thick. It was so huge. And so I used that like all through, I think, my second year in, uh, in school because I needed to learn on my own. So anyways, by the time... The third year rolled over where my French got better and I had friends and again, I had made um, France my home. Mom decided that we needed to move again because there wasn't really a lot of opportunities for her there. So at this point, um, we had two choices, either go to the States or go to Canada. And we wanted to come to Canada. We couldn't get a visa. There was no way. So she found, my mom found this smuggler um, <laughs> and that she knew through some other friends who had used them before. So back then, this is now going back like over 30 years ago, she paid him 10,000 US dollars, which she didn't have, right? She had to borrow that. So she gave him that money. Now, um, we were to go meet him in Spain from France. So again, we picked up, you know, two suitcases 
Uh, and at this point, I'm 17 and my brother is 11. So we go to, we, we take the train to Spain. We meet this guy, right? And he's like, he's driving a BMW. I would never forget that. And he kept on talking about going to the Canaries Island. And I thought back then, this is not a good guy. Like, I don't know if I should trust him, but I would never go to the Canary Island. <laughs> if, to this day, I, I swear, this is one of those places where I'm like, I will never go there. It's just that experience anyway so he he made us passports do you want to know how he made us passports? Yeah. he brought over fake passports that belonged to french citizens and he took back then it wasn't so technologically yeah. advanced he he removed the laminate he took the blow dryer to it he removed the laminate he changed the photos and he, he oh my <laughs> put it back on and so here's my mom brick all of a sudden, she became this French woman, uh, and uh, my my little brother, who at the time was eleven, in her passport was there. There was a picture of a companion, but he was only six. <sighs> so, and me, I had to play a twenty-five-year-old French girl. Oh my goodness! So. <laughs> We had to, we had to play the part of French people. Uh, so, anyways, we we went through. Good thing uh, you were studying French out of that book for right? those three years, because now you're a French girl. And so I was a French girl. Yeah. Except I didn't look French because <laughs> I was Middle Eastern with a whole lot of ha facial hair and yeah. the stash and everything. <laughs> so, anyways, my mom had to like do like a whole makeover for me. Anyways. So we, we went to Spain. Uh, so from Spain, we had to go to um, Lisbon, Portugal, because at the time there was a lot of um, people trying to um, leave illegally. So they knew. They caught on. So they said uh, it's better to go from Lisbon. So again, we took the train from Madrid to Lisbon, and um, finally it was the day for our flight, and we went to the airport. They didn't notice the fake passports just come on they by. let us come on they in. let us in i mean that was just by miracle i don't know how that happened i don't know how that happens yeah. today honestly miles it's such a vulnerable position and so when i hear all, of all these like refugees trying to come through i feel yeah, for them full being, empathy for yeah where they're because coming from. i was there right so anyways we came through montreal actually and we walked to the uh, to the custom agents and um, without even looking at us he goes passport and my mom says no passports and um, he says again passports my mom says no passports and he looks up at my mom and at this point he's like really mad right he's like no passport no Canada and my mom just lost it like she had been this strong woman right all through this journey and at that moment she's like oh. she started crying and she's like i'm tired my kids are tired you know we're we're, we're refugees yeah so she, I, and i looked at her and she's like don't worry there's nothing they can do like they're they're gonna have to let us through there's nothing they can do so anyways that was it it's amazing though you go through all those uh, different spots get right to in Montreal and that's like I'm tired of this this is where refugees help us yeah right instead yeah. of did you think that if she showed the passport and said that you're from France oh, he'd we, be like we didn't we didn't have the passports oh. because we were told to rip the passport oh. on the plane gotcha. <laughs> mid air <Okay. laughs> because if they had the passports if we showed the passports you couldn't be refugees because yeah. you had a yeah um, you know, you have no reason. You got to go back to where you came from. Yeah. So anyways, but Canada was so hospitable. It was so nice. From that point on, it was like, come home. Yeah, <laughs> a was, breath of fresh air. That's it. That's it. And that's where my story actually starts in Canada. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> I, love, I love Canada so much. Yeah, I love what Canada. What a great story. So I, thank you. So how thank old you. are you? So you're... 17 this then? this is 17 yeah on paper you were 25 yeah. until you got on the flight then you're back to 17 <laughs> yes, again so yes. you're 17 and wow that's uh 
a lifetime of experiences all before the age of 18 years old. Uh, yeah, but you, like, you know, you actually, I didn't think so. Like, I didn't realize that yeah. back then. I think today I look at it, I'm like, yeah. Yeah, you self-reflect yeah. backwards. And, yeah. And, uh, and it, it's really a gift, too. You get such a beautiful perspective when you go through stuff like that, even though it's hard and just crazy at the time, but you know, really opens up your eyes. Oh my gosh, does it ever. I mean, I, it puts me in a unique position, actually. I always talk about this. Um, I go, Canada is, pff, I, to me, the best place in the world to live, right? And I go, I, I will never take that for granted. I will never take the running water for granted. Yeah. I will never take the <laughs> organized road for, like, the working traffic lights for granted. I will never take the the street I walk on at 11 o'clock yeah. at night for granted. These are the things that people around the world don't have. And so for us to complain about the potholes. It's so funny too. Like I was talking with my buddy last week in here too. And cause we were both born in 1991 in New Market, Ontario, Canada. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we are saying to ourselves, like we already won the lottery. Like, we're so lucky. So, um, and we constantly try to have that perspective to not complain mm -hmm. because you have to understand that, you know, the majority of the world doesn't live like this. Oh and gosh. it's a blessing to be here. Well, good for you. Very insightful. Yes. So, you're here in Canada. You're 17 years old. Yeah. Uh, it's a breath of fresh air. Yes. So, <laughs> it was it was fun. Now, again, like, you know, okay, English now. And yeah. And uh, new friends, n you know, new places, new streets, new everything. And but you know what? It was like, OK, we're here. This is our final destination. We're going to make this home. Yeah. And so so it was. And I, I did like I went full force. The thing is, um, I, I feel like I always had to work harder than everybody else because I was always behind, yeah. you know, so but. This is, this is what I'm thinking now, and looking back, I laugh all the time, because I started in grade 11 at 17, so I, I they put me one year behind, but I had to study ESL. At the same time I was studying ESL, I was also doing Hamlet. <laughs> I'm like, how did I do that? <laughs> I have no idea how you did that. How did I do How does a person write essays? With no English. My, my ESL teacher was the best. Though. And uh, math and bi biology yeah. and chemistry. So I did all of those things with regular kids. But, you know, we're resilient. Yeah. Just battle through. Mm -hmm. Make when, it happen. Yeah. When we're young, we, we have the power because nothing stops us. Because yeah. We don't have the experiences of failure yet. So... Um, we we can do anything yeah. right so i mean that's the beauty of it uh, and i think i wish we could take that into our adulthood where um, people saying oh you can't do that or oh that's too much do you think you can train the mind to be more like that even no matter what age you are of course yeah i believe so oh too. yeah mindset yeah. is um it's totally in your own control yeah so one thing i learned through the years was that um so this is now, this is a pretty new, I think, finding for me because I had to start um, really growing myself um, about, I'm going to say four years ago, something happened to me and I, I started on this route of self-development and um, really trying to get to know myself for the first time in my life. I had been too busy yeah. before then. <laughs> so... Um, so that's that's a totally different yeah, we'll, story. We're, we're going to get to that yeah. for sure. We're going to get to that. Diving deep into the self-awareness. I love that. Yeah. yeah. So after high school, do you go to um, go do more schooling or do you just start working? Like what's the next step after high school? Um, you're still in Quebec at this time? No, 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 no. We never stayed okay. in Montreal. We came, came straight, straight through uh, to Toronto. Okay. Yeah, we took that bus overnight and we were in Toronto okay. at 6 a.m. So, um, so after high school, my mom, just like every single Iranian parent, wanted her kid to be a doctor. Yeah, that's the path. <laughs> that's the path. <laughs> okay, if not a doctor, at least a lawyer. Yeah. Okay, if not a lawyer, at least a dentist, <laughs> yeah. right? 
but that didn't happen for me. But I, I went to U of T, I went to university and um, I took sciences. Soon I found out that I was much more into the partying part of university life yeah. than studying. So my marks were really low and I, I couldn't fool myself. So I did but you finish. you those life experiences. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I had fun. Yeah. I had fun. No regrets. No. Um, so but no lawyer or doctor. Passed. No, no, no. That didn't happen. So after four years, um, actually five years, it took me five years to finish a three-year degree. I'm sorry to say, but I had a lot of fun. Uh, so <laughs> so um, I came out of university and I was like, okay, now what? I was already working in retail, but I always had this entrepreneurial mind and I wanted to try new things. Every time I wanted to try this new thing and somebody came to me, oh, let me show you this. Okay. Let, you know, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Amway. Mm, no. Nope. So this is like back in the day. This was like one of the original um, network marketing uh, companies and it was big. Yeah. It was big. And so I met uh, these people who introduced me to Amway and they made it sound like this amazing thing. I was like, yes, I'm going to do this. So um, the best thing that came out of that for me was I didn't have, I never even made a penny. Okay. But the best thing that came out of that for me was that I was introduced to the um, world of motivational speaking yeah so we used to go to these like big conferences, conferences yeah. and there'd be like raw, raw. thousands yeah. of people yeah. and there was these people on the stage and they, they have so it's much infectious. power oh my gosh you look around you and there's like sea of people and they're all like they're just gonna go out there and do it right yeah you can like literally feel the energy yes in the room. yes yeah. and i loved it not being in the audience I wanted to be up there on the stage. On the stage. I was like, never mind this. Yeah. I want to do what they do. Like, re- you know, just like motivating these people, inspiring them, telling them that they can do anything. What power, right? And so this is what I always wanted to do. Like, I imagined myself up there and I used to listen to all these tapes and I used to practice, 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 practice. And um, so... When I left Amway, uh, it was around a time when I was really, um, there was a really hard time of my life because I found out that my brother had um, had been diagnosed with schizophrenia. Okay. So that was a really tough blow. So just, I let it overtake uh, my life and it I put myself back. So I, I lived years with, with this story that oh if only my brother yeah. was well yeah then i'd be doing this and yeah. i'd be doing you used that it as your own crutch yes yeah. yes and so years went by and um um i was always like unhappy you know um even though I had my own business and it was like everything looked so good from yeah. the outside i had you know i was married to this awesome guy we had a great family we had, we were having fun and i traveled and i had this amazing business that it's like almost every other woman's dream is like to own their own flower shop yeah um but you know deep down inside when you're not happy yeah yeah like, only you can re- truly know oh that. of yeah, course yeah. yes yes so when did the flower shop come to be like when did you come to new market so um when my son was born um, i decided that okay enough of this <laughs> joking around i need to have a solid uh, yeah. career a business that i could call my own so we're sitting around this is back in 2002 no, 2001, end of 2001, um, in November, sitting around uh, with um, my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law, and my husband. I said, guys, let's just start a business together. And uh, so we're all really young, and uh, my brother-in-law goes, okay, so how about a flower shop? I go, hmm, flower shop. Okay, 
Now, you got to realize that at this point in my life, I had no idea what a carnation is or what a rose is. Like, <laughs> I, no, I was clueless. But the idea was, wow, like my own business? Are yeah. you kidding? This is going to be the most fun thing ever. So I jumped on this. And this is what I say also um, all the time is I think it's one of my biggest assets is that I am just fearless like i i jump into things sometimes it's not good um i used to do it more often i'm trying to be a little bit more careful <laughs> now but i when when i get an idea i love that the rush of trying to make it happen you know like to make something yeah. happen you of know. saying yes and then moving forward yes and you probably it. know that oh yeah because, right oh yeah so like if you're doing something like this, it does not, it's, this is not for everybody, you know? Uh, so so I, I jumped right on it. I'm like, okay, what can I do first? So of course, you know, I within the first week, I had um, the name of the business picked. We had a logo picked. I had already talked to a guy about a fridge and like I, <laughs> I, I knew... But of course, I still didn't know the difference between a rose and a carnation. And sometimes things happen. I think all the time things happen. In When you're in that moment, you don't realize why this is happening. But then afterwards, in retrospect, you look back and say, oh my gosh, if that hadn't happened, this would not have yeah. happened. And that's the reason why that happened. So I met this guy who sold me the probably the most useless fridge <laughs> but he connected me to this awesome floral school which would get me prepared which would give me what i needed the yeah. basics in three weeks i was like yes that's what i need the good thing about uh saying yes and not knowing anything is that there's so much to learn that you can start checking things off the list right like one thing leads to another thing to another thing to another thing and it's moving you're getting momentum going so that's a beautiful thing too even though it's like i don't know anything about this flower business but let's do it right it's, it's just so much fun so that's that's what I found too. Yeah, I found that I found that I was enjoying that that process of yeah. you know Learning. making things happen. Yeah. It's like accomplishment after accomplishment. This is this is fun. It's fun making things happen, right? So anyways, um so the idea came in November and on February 7th Flowers and Things officially opened. <laughs> i know it's right. crazy wow three months that's amazing three months plus you're opening i'm pretty sure valentine's day is in february yeah. so, so good time week, to open <laughs> that was my idea it's yeah. like okay we're gonna open just before valentine's It'd day be so busy that we don't even we know need to <laughs> yeah. we need to be it's a good busy. kickstart though it was great I and mean, we had a bunch of people show up to our open house i think the mayor came was Alton. it always that location it was actually across from the tannery mall people okay. will probably not remember that little it was like a little house yeah uh, by the river and uh, it used to be years ago, it used to be Beaver Lumber, but then it wasn't, there was a lawyer's office upstairs and we rented the, f the first floor. It was really cute. Yeah. Uh, but uh, when the construction happened back uh, 10 years ago, they, that was the first building they had to knock down because it was uh -huh. right on the river. So we moved. But yeah, so that's where we started. And I swear every day, um, I... I faked it. <laughs> yeah, till you made it. Till I made it. Um, I I would never forget the very first um, funeral arrangement I made. It took me four and a half hours. I was working yeah. <laughs> for four and a half hours to make that arrangement. For every every flower I put in the vase, I moved back <laughs> to look at it yeah. from far. <laughs> Tweaking it, tweaking it, it so right to the very last yes. minute. So it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so what year was that when it launched? So 2002. 2002. Yeah. Quick turnaround. Hey, uh, let's uh, let's start a business. Yes, let's start a business. How about a flower shop? Okay, let's learn everything. And let's launch three months, three months Three later. months. 
and that's in 2002 and been crushing it ever since yeah yeah i have to say i'm very happy we've gone through a lot though my, uh, i i gotta i gotta admit yeah a lot 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 yes okay we're gonna yeah. get into uh some ups and downs yes. when we get back okay okay we'll be right back all right just a quick shout out to our sponsor, Buzz505. Buzz505 was founded by the Snap team to create a new way to record and develop a professional turnkey solution to podcasting. They recognize the power of podcasting and they have been great to work with in making of this podcast. Check out www.buzz505.com to learn more. Back to the show. And we are back. So, flowers and things launched, learned a lot, but fade it till you made it. But then you eventually did make it because, well, you put four and a half hours on that one arrangement. So, you quickly got to 10,000 hours. Uh, putting stuff together and becoming a master, right? That's what it takes, doesn't it? Yeah, 10,000 hours, that's what they say. Yeah. So you're probably past that real soon. <laughs> and uh, right before we broke, you said there's lots of challenges. Sure. Right? And that's something that I always want to bring up at doing these mm -hmm. because, like I said, everything looks so nice and easy from the outside. Yes. But even I know personally from the inside, it is a battle and you never know what you're going to get and stuff's going to come from left field. So if you could touch on a couple challenges, sure. That'd be wonderful. Um, okay. First I want to make sure that we make a differentiation here. Okay. And a lot of people might not say this out loud, but it's so true. And I, if anything, I want people to learn from this could be this, that there's a big difference between owning a business and being self-employed yeah so i think uh, i think being self-employed means you uh, create a job for yourself okay and i think <laughs> that's a big difference between owning a business yep and having a job that's yours that nobody's going to so would off. you say like you know maybe what would what would you label like are you talking about if you ha have a building have employees yes. then that, that's what yeah. makes it the business piece of it rather than um you know a personal trainer that like as they're that is running that so what i'm talking about is having a business means having a system yeah in place where you teach other people yeah. to run your business even if you're not there yeah. and it's running smoothly and you don't need to be there okay that's that was not our case yeah and so um i i so i i'm i'm passing on my experience yeah. here right and a lot of people are not going to tell you this because oh it's got to look good from the outside. Yeah, right? yeah. So you were doing everything. <clears throat> oh, then. absolutely. Yeah. You wear all the hats, yeah. right? But um, we we did go through a lot. <clears throat> we went through almost two bankruptcies. We. That's <coughs> <coughs> fine. Sorry. Case, and we'll cut that out. <clears throat> okay. Good. Um. Where it was like, yeah, like we were hanging on by nail. And you, you've you heard the, when they say, oh, it's the seven years, if yeah. you pass the seven year, then you're okay. That's not true. That's not true. Because yeah. it can happen at any moment. So, um, especially when you don't have prior business um, experience or um education yeah i think that's so important i mean i could have used business management experience yeah. or or education instead of science that would have been good no <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I always say that of like you know i wish uh, in high school they taught me like how to do taxes instead of cutting open a frog oh and seeing God. what's inside i'm telling you <laughs> or or how to handle stress yeah. don't you think that would have been a useless yeah. useful skill to learn in high school oh absolutely 
I know. Anyways, that's a there's a long list that you could a, switch yeah. out. But. That's that's a different talk. I I think it's a very important talk. Yeah, so. yeah. Um. So so yeah. So two close to bankruptcies, and then the construction. Yeah. Happened, and that was tough. I mean, so many businesses up and left uh, because they just couldn't survive anymore. And this was this was a very um, trying time for us. But I think it was because, again that resiliency right and not giving up and yeah does the town do anything for you when like that <clears> happens <throat> to those business owners or like is it just I think hang, hang tight well the town will be done in a year or yeah. two or three it, was, it took longer than two or three years yeah. honestly I, I mean it's funny how you forget i don't remember now how many years but um the town tries they try. Yeah. I think everybody just does their best. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of personal responsibility, I think, involved. And sometimes you can just, you can take a situation and say, okay, this is, it is what it is. I'm giving up, right? Or you can say, no, let me see what I can learn through all of this and hang in there and make adjustments and, yeah. you know, take a lesson. I mean, that's what life is, right? So it was, it was, we, it was a lot of, there was a lot of learning. There was a lot of, um, um, peeling <laughs> layers like the onion, right? Yeah. <laughs> You've heard that before. Yeah. So, but I, I mean, when you get, when you get, um, to the bottom of it, it is, it is all about resilience and hanging in tight. So two questions for you. Yeah. With that, it's like, you know, just from hearing your story right now, you were faced with uh, adversity in front of you and had to be resilient since you were a kid, mm -hmm. right? Obviously, going through those pieces gives you the ability to adapt and overcome these new challenges that come. Even it's like now you're in this the beautiful Canada, but now you're faced with brand new challenges mm -hmm. that you would have never expected to mm -hmm. be coming. Mm -hmm. But you know, you make it happen, you put the work in and you overcome that, right? It's got to be those the training from your whole life to be able to do that. Most people can't do that. I think everybody's capable of doing yeah. that. I think it's it's just whether you tell yourself what you tell yourself, right? You, yeah, but don't you think don't own, to have that self-talk, right? You need to be constantly having that self-talk over, I think, a longer period of time. Not when, just when the going gets tough, be like, no, I can be tough now. Or do you think that it can just be like a light switch? Um, I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's like that. I think this is what, what probably is missing in someone's life when they're not doing that is, is that purpose, is that clear goal, right? It's that compelling and clear um um, um, a reason of why you're doing something. Of course, if, yeah. if it's not, if, if it, the reason is not clear, if the reason is, if your why is not compelling enough, why would you do it? Um, okay, so here's, I learned this and I'm going to share this with you, okay? There's a formula and that says, um, if, if you're not uncomfortable enough, why change? And if there's no hope, why even try? So I think that that really resonates with me because I was really uncomfortable and I needed to change. And that has happened again and again yeah. and again. Uh, but if there's no hope, then why do, why would you even try? And so if, if you don't see the hope, why would you try? Yeah. You see, I, like, I have a similar clouds and dirt, right? Clouds is like the up here, kind of like that dream of it, right? the hope and then the dirt is like doing the actual work getting uncomfortable yeah. right and it takes both yeah to make anything happen absolutely yeah yeah and so you touched on it early before that i believe it was four from four years ago is when you started to dive deep into self-awareness yes. and you know self-reflecting and kind of changing so yes. is 
am I missing something leading up to that or is it, does the journey start? Uh, I think my journey, yeah, I, w- I would say, I would say like yes. Like this new chapter. This new chapter, yeah. right? So I told you that for years I had blamed my brother yeah. and my dad and my the government of Iran and yeah. blah, 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 blah. Because the list can go on if you, when you're blaming others, right, for everything that's going wrong in your life. And then you found a distraction with working crazy hard. Yes, and yeah. so that was my... That was my relief. Yeah. Right. So work hard because you're really good at that. There's, there's nothing, nothing can come in your way if you're just working. Yeah. Right. So I did. And you can control it. Yes. And you can control yeah. it. And so I did. I worked a lot, a lot, a lot. And so at one point, what happened was that I went away <clears throat> and I came back and I was really sick really sick like to a point where i thought i was gonna die i had no idea what was happening to me i went to the hospital several several times they couldn't figure it out uh and i for the first time in my life i'm like oh my gosh i'm dying so one day and i was really weak so one day i i walk to the bathroom and i look in the mirror and i look at my eyes and they're like so there's like this light in my eyes but i'm like so sick i look so sick so all of a sudden i i get this i get this urge to look up and i am not at this point in time i am not spiritual i'm not believing in god or anything like that okay so i look up and all of a sudden i start crying i'm like what is the meaning of this like what am i supposed to learn from this and at that point I knew. It was like, wow. I have been taking my life for granted. And then I decided, okay, this is it. From now on, I am going to make sure I take advantage of every little moment. And I mean, it could be that everybody who comes to that point when you're really fearing your own mortality, facing your mortality, that you get to that point of, oh my gosh, I'm, I've been taking this for granted. But I, I, I'd like to call that my spiritual awakening. Yeah. So um, that was it. Then I think it took a lot for me to admit that there was something wrong. Um, so, you know... I had a lot of addictions and um, like different things, right? It's different things. Uh, it's not when we're talking about addiction, it's not just drugs no. or alcohol. No. Like it's, you know, it could be work. Yeah, be, for sure. So anything, right? And, but I didn't know how to help myself. So um, I opened up to um, some friends and um, they said uh, that I should talk to a life coach. I was like, shit, mm-hmm. like, I'm not going to talk to a yeah. stranger. Like, yeah. That's like, that's weird. But I did because I was really uncomfortable, right? I needed that yeah. change. I, I, I had the motivation. So I did. And uh, I, I talked to this woman. Her, her name is Carlene Gilbertson. <laughs> I call her my angel. Shout out to the angel. Yeah, she knows. So she, oh my gosh, she was so patient with me. And um, I, it, it was costly. I spent the money, yeah. but it was like necessary. I, that was like, I knew, I knew I needed to change. So how quickly before you felt like, you know, I even go back to the momentum thing. I, I truly believe in momentum on everything, right? It's kind of finding the life coach, the angel, start have sessions with sessions with her and then you start to feel like yourself opening up and yourself changing and kind of i guess the light coming in so um yes yes kind of like i i was you know i was getting things done um she suggested i have a um she she really that was like the best one of the best things she said to me she said Della, you need a space of your own and i've never had that before i was like what are you talking about? 
this is my house. Like, I have yeah. the whole house. She's like, no. I was like, have a space for you where you can go in and shut the door and just be you. So, like, when I when I made one, an office space for me and I went out and bought this desk, that was the biggest gift I ever gave to myself. Yeah. And was, that was really meaningful to me. And I made that office space. So that was like one of the big wins for me. As I was getting stronger, um, though, because my brother is still there, right? That's that's the big shadow of my life, uh, on, on my life. So um, I think five months into speaking with Carlene, I got a call from my brother. At this point, we hadn't talked to him for a long time. And so, um, do, do we have time to yeah. get into this? Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so then uh, he, I got a call from from a stranger. Uh, and then I he uh, she or he passed the phone to my brother. And he was calling from the hospital. And he said that he had broken his shoulder. And if I could go get him. Um, and, uh, of course I did me and my mom, we drove there. And as soon as I saw him, I knew he was homeless because you, you just tell. Yeah. Right. And, uh, to this day, I really feel like that happened on purpose because he was at the end of his rope. So we brought him home to new market and he was so sick. Um, his schizophrenia was really, really bad. So he would, um, so he would be up all night. And this is for people who, um, perhaps know someone who has a mental illness, because this is really tough on the whole family. And I've kind of made it my mission to talk about it because as caregivers, we can get so deeply drawn into uh, our loved one's illness. That we can forget all about ourselves. And so, and, and um, we, we can really suffer. So when my brother um, was there, my mom and I both suffered. But we needed to help him because I, I figured for the first time in all these years, I finally saw it firsthand. So I got help. Um, and this was a big step for me because until that moment, I never talked about it. Yeah. The big stigma. So I, I opened up. And it's amazing because when you open up about any problem, I feel like so many things happen. First of all, when you open up, you see that there are so many other people who are going through something similar. It was amazing. Did you know that one out of 100 people suffer from a schizophrenia? I did not know that. That's a big number. That's a lot of people. Yes. And um, so as soon as I opened up, it was like, oh, so-and-so knew someone. This person knew someone. This person knew. This person's sister was suffering. This person's brother-in-law was suffering. I was like, why isn't anybody talking about this? But it was that. Fear. It was what you had just, you yeah. had been doing, right? Yeah. This is my problem. I'm keeping it internally to me, right? Yeah. And it's not until you open that up that you see many, many people are relating to you. Absolutely. And you're all stronger together. That's, and that's, and that's another thing because, because you, all of a sudden you see all these other people also suffer from the same thing. There's hope in unity, right? So it, that, that hope, all of a sudden I had hope, right? Oh my gosh, I'm not alone. This is good. Other people also understand. And then you, you get help because now that you're open to it, 
the doors open yeah. you know the community is around you yes the source the the resources come into your life and i found a great resource in the canadian mental health association because they're 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 treasure i mean they're, they're a hidden treasure i feel like that that amazing organization can help help so many people so i took a course um that was 10 10 days long 10 sorry 10 weeks uh, one one day per week and uh, at the end of the course I learned so much communications resources um, all the different symptoms how to speak to my brother but above all I learned about self-care as a caregiver and I you know that was like the first time for me I was hearing words for the first time yeah like self-care, boundaries, self-love, self-compassion, you know, like all these different things, or, or forgiveness. And here's the thing, as caregivers, I, I don't, I'm, I'm sure there's so many people out there, we have this problem and we feel like it's our fault that somehow we played a role in this, right? And so it was so freeing. And I realized that when I was changing, as I was changing, my brother was changing towards me. Yeah, his the frequencies were... Yes, yes. It's amazing how that works. Yeah. So that was a big step for me. And then I realized, oh my gosh, this world is so deep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right? And I was like, oh, my God, give me this. Give me this seminar. Give me that seminar. Give me this workshop. Give me that podcast. And I just... Became ah, a sponge. Oh, absolutely. And um, one day, I was going through a real crisis. And um, and this is one of those resources I had learned to, through the Canadian Mental Health Association. Um, I was having a panic attack. Um it was just really, really bad. So there was there was this one phone number that I remembered calling, and uh, it's um, three one cope, and it's it's in York region, and um, it's an amazing uh, lifeline. And so I called that number, and the woman uh, at in the at the other side, she just said to me, to just just breathe. And she led me through this breathing exercise. exercise for like a minute or so. She was so calm and she was so relaxed. And I was like, oh, my God, this is so good. <laughs> right. This is like amazing. So the breath changes your body chemistry. Oh, my God. <laughs> and we breathe all the time. Yeah. Right. And, and we just don't most of us don't know how to breathe properly. Have you looked into Wim Hof at all? No, Wim I don't, Hof? No, okay. I don't know. I'll send Wim Hof uh, some links to you. But his is all about breath work and cold exposure too, right? Ice baths or cold showers and breathing techniques. But I'm sure you'll dive in deep to Wim Hof after I send it to you. I don't know about the cold showers. <laughs> oh, <laughs> they're easy after a while. After a while. <laughs> after a while. But yeah, yeah, they are cold. Yeah. But, you know. Getting uncomfortable is a good thing. Yeah, you you have to do that. Uh, you're you know you have to get uncomfortable um, to to grow. Yeah. Uh, what's that one saying? Get comfortable with get comfortable with getting uncomfortable if you want to grow. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Okay, so we will. I'm definitely gonna have you back for another ah, sure. another session. Yeah. But um, before you were coming on, I was going through you, all your, it's Della's voice, right? Yeah. And it's on Facebook Watch? It's on Facebook and YouTube. Okay. So everyone check out that. And what's your, you know, couple sentences on Della's voice and what you kind of bring to it? That's also why I want to bring you back on again and we'll dive like super deep into okay. Della's voice. Okay. Right? Um, but even just to leave with 
couple of minutes on sure, Bella's voice. Sure, sure. And, and I mean, it all it is all related, right? Bella's yeah. voice is kind of obvious why I have that. I because I didn't never really had a voice before, and I found my voice as I was transforming. And I thought if I could just let people know what's happening with me. Maybe that one person is going through the same thing can learn something, right? So that's how I started it. And then soon I, I, I thought, you know what? My knowledge is very limited. I need to brokerage other people's knowledge. So there's all these amazing people who have so much to offer and they have a story to tell because they've all had amazing lives and they're, they're impacting the world in so many ways but they don't have the platform. So, you know, let me interview them. And, and that's how it started. So that was Della's voice. And uh, my tagline is to spark your soul, which is really to bring inspiration, uh, information, inspiration, and motivation to change for wellness recovery. Uh, and hope. Hope is the biggest thing for me because it was so long I was hopeless. And hope stands for hold on, pain ends. I love it. <laughs> All right. So everyone watch out for a part two. We're definitely going to do that. We'll <laughs> dive the whole episode. We'll just do it about that because I love that stuff. Thank so. you. Thank you for Thank having you so me, much. Miles. That was awesome. Okay. Thank you so much for your listeners. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye.